Hello, and welcome to episode 99 of the Carrier's Edge podcast. I am Mark Morell, co-founder of Carrier's Edge, joined this week by... Jane Jazrawi, the other co-founder. Who started this podcast session by asking, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so the theme so of today's like, what's episode... What's wrong with you? Theme of today's episode, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with Mark? What's up with that boy? <laughs> So here we are, where are we? Middle of February, Mm -hmm. latter part of February. The last episode that we did was announcement day. Yes, that was an exciting day. we spent the whole time basically griping about how we had to get up early and fight with Facebook to get our announcements posted properly. And now we've had three weeks to... Get over it. And find other things to fight with to... uh, get announcements out and notifications and things like that. Mm-hmm. So as it happens, we've both been doing a fair bit of media yes. in the past little bit. So fair that bit. makes it easier for me to figure out topics. So well, I don't have to do very much hard work. You can just tell me uh, about the uh, interview that you did earlier well, today. Well, it was interesting. I was doing an interview with the freight coach, Chris Dolly, and... Um, it was a good conversation, so it's going to come out in a couple of weeks, uh, so beginning of March, I think, so keep an eye out for that. We were, I think what happens is sometimes our PR company, um, and I will use the uh, Ryan, who the, the guy that we, who's at uh, Sifke's Pettit, uh, Pettit, that is our PR Why company. Why do you even bother trying? You know you're not going to get it. Sifke's Pettit. No. No, Seifkin, Seifkis, Seifkis Pettit. Apologies, Doug and Ryan. Oh, Stug and Ryan. Yes. What is Just it? Just go with that. Seifkis Pettit. Seifkis Pettit. Didn't I say that? No, I did not. Oh, you have to forgive people for names. I forgive everybody for the butchering of my name. So anyway, Ryan, uh, I think sent him a lot of talking points, far too many oh, for no. poor Chris. <laughs> Did we send these talking points through? I don't Ryan? know. I don't okay. know. But he was starting. So the issue is that we have like we can talk about pretty much anything because everything that we do with best ways to drive for touches on some aspect of a driver's life or a driver's work experience, not their lives, but their work experience. And so what we do is. Well, the the competition has sections. So the questionnaire that you have to fill out has these sections and there's, it starts with an overview of the business and then it's like compensation and then non-financial or benefits. And then it goes into humor and resources, operational strategy. And there's a couple other ones, but there's all these sections. And what ends up happening is that we have a lot to say about any one, any number of these sections. Like we can talk about two questions for an hour and a half, like just two questions out of the entire thing. It's like a hundred questions, but because it just is, it goes on and on about like the questions are just are so massive that it's difficult for people to figure out what to talk about. So what I try and do when I'm talking to people is, you know, find out what they're interested in and if you go in order of the actual questionnaires or the the information we get from the questionnaire, then you get bogged down in money and you never get anywhere else. And that's bogged kind down of, in money. Bogged down in money. There, there you go. That's the tagline for this episode. Bogged down in money. Compensation and benefits tend to be what everybody always talks about because that's first on the list. But there's this whole enormous bunch of information that you'll never get to unless you kind of look at it and go, okay, what do I want to talk about? What is interesting to me? And we ended up talking a lot about compensation and, and benefits in the podcast because I think that's what happened. He, he just started with the beginning and, and he said it after a while, he's like, there's so much here. And I'm like, well, yeah, there is so much. Yeah, you don't we, have to talk about all of it. I can tell you, I can talk about like tons of different things. And we had talked about uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles before the podcast. I don't think it ever made it into the podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about, you know, driver appreciation week and how people just, you know, put on a couple of barbecues for that week and think that they're stellar employers, that kind of thing. 
And but that never made it in. So like we were talking about all kinds of stuff, but it wasn't even in the in the actual recorded podcast. So it'll be interesting. It was a really good conversation, but it tended to talk about mostly about uh, compensation and how drivers are compensated and and um, asking the right questions when you when you go and look for a good carrier. It, you know, don't listen for just the regular the regular spiel because they'll all tell you the same thing. Be, oh, you got great miles. You got great this, great this. But ask about what you want. Yeah, that's really interesting because generally, when I'm in an interview and the interviewer starts with a like, tell me about comp and tell me about the benefits and what do you see in compensation, I kind of roll my eyes. Sometimes I have to do that in my head and not overtly. Uh, but it's usually the least interesting part of the conversation with any fleet. Compensation and benefits is pretty much the least interesting part of it because they're all paying the same. You can make good money, you can make terrible money at every fleet. So it ends up not being that much of an an interesting conversation to have. But you hit an interesting point there with the way that drivers need to start thinking about this and what they should be asking and the kind of questions they should be asking about, which is very similar to something that I'm going to be talking about um, when we do, uh, we're doing an education session at Mid-America at the end of next month, which is going to be the first time that we're talking about Best Fleet stuff with an audience that I assume will be largely drivers. And I am very eager to talk to them and say, you all are going about it wrong. You're finding jobs the wrong way. (laughs) Do it differently. Stop asking about compensation. Well, before... Before we started the podcast, we had a very interesting conversation about California. And everybody mm. hates California because right. uh, we were talking, I said something about how we had driven across the country, across Canada in our, in our uh, Tesla. Mm-hmm. And, and I said it was, it was not a problem because Tesla's put, you know, uh, stations, charging stations everywhere. And he was saying that where he is in Arizona, it's about a five hour drive to Las Vegas. And he wouldn't be able to do it because there's no charging stations. Although he doesn't drive a he doesn't drive an electric vehicle, so he may not know. Yeah, I have a hard time with that because I'm sure that Tesla's got stuff on the interstates. I don't know, but it just occurs to me that he may not know because he was talking about how he doesn't want to drive an electric. He has driven them. He doesn't like them. He likes the whole uh, feeling of diesel and and fuel and revving and all of that. So he likes the feeling of a car. Mm. And that is a really good point about electric vehicles versus non-electric vehicles is that the feeling is very different. You, the feeling of operating the vehicle is much quieter and smoother and touchier, Yeah, I think. And when you're in a, a fuel-driven car, I can't even like a, kind of a regular car, you feel like you are part of the machinery and you you feel like especially when you're driving a stick right you feel this you feel the gears you feel when the car needs you to do things you are kind of you know you're kind of one with the car and you do not have that feeling in an electric car you feel like you are operating the car yes and it's it's a much different driving experience and i think that when EVs become more common in the trucking um in the industry people are going to start kind of commenting on that, that it is not, it is not driving, it's not driving a diesel engine. No, I can see that being really unsettling. If you've based your entire career around driving a diesel engine, driving a a regular truck, you've got tens or hundreds of thousands of miles of listening to that engine, of feeling the way it responds and interacting with it in the way that you have to, even if you're on an automatic versus a manual. And then to go to an EV where all of that is gone, it's entirely different. Yeah. For us, it's car drivers, gone. that it is when you're on an electric, when, you know, for us, car drivers who don't drive all that much, it's not that different. And yeah, I don't really, I didn't love it one way or another, you know, with a, a gas powered engine. So I don't really care. It gets me where I'm going and it's fine. But I don't have a career based around operating this engine at maximum efficiency. So I can see a lot of drivers being very unsettled and it's going to be 
kind of a generational change, mm-hmm. just like moving from manual to automatic was. Well, I think there are still drivers who would rather have a manual and yeah. and don't want to drive automatic. And automatic, it seems like very manual compared to electric. Yeah. But there's a whole bunch of different things that you have to be careful of in an electric car or an electric vehicle. You mm-hmm. just have to pay attention to, it's just different. So how did that come up in a podcast about best fleet stuff? Were you talking about the environmental question? And well, I w- well, we were just we were just kind of talking before it didn't come up in the podcast. This mm. is the like kind of the outside of the podcast conversation, and he said that he didn't like it, and and you know he he's driven them and he thinks it's very cool, but you know it's not for him. And and then he made a, a comment about you know he likes he likes the freedom to be able to choose what he wants and he hopes that it's not going to be federally regulated or anything like that because he wants, he wants to have the freedom to do what he wants. And I said, and because he said, you know, California is, you know, mandating this and you know, that's horrible. And I said, (laughs) and everybody in trucking will probably hate me for this, that, Someone has to, someone has to put their foot down, has to draw a line in the sand or nobody's going to do anything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and California tends to be the one who's de- who making decisions that, yeah, it, sometimes they're the wrong decisions, but they are the ones that will kind of move the, like move the needle mm-hmm. because before before California started talking about making everything electric by blah, 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 it was like, people were like iffy. Like yeah, nobody's sort of, really serious about it. Yeah. No one wants to go first and no one wants to Im- invest and no one wants to do, you know, well, there's no, there's a lot of push to invest. There's no reason to invest. Yeah. So you're making a good point that it may not be the right decision, but at least it's a decision. And if you bring something better, then that decision can change. But at least there's momentum. At least there's some movement now. And I said, you know, so would you have been against seatbelts? Because mm. seatbelt was a federal regulation that everybody had to do it. And, and everybody and, hated at the time. And yeah. all the car manufacturers said it was going to bankrupt them. Yeah. And and I think that there's some of that. I, I think whenever, you know, a government is making, trying to make a decision that is supposed to be for the good of everybody down the line, individuals have a hard, harder time with that because it can really affect them adversely. Mm-hmm. But I think in, and, and I also think that electric vehicles may not be the way that things go. It might. And like you've mm, said before, be. is that you think is drone that you think it'll be drones. Well, that's a whole different thing. But in the meantime, yeah, we will have to get out, out of fossil fuel and all of the people that are trying to stall California and making the biggest noise about how it's never going to work are also the same people that are rushing to get a viable solution onto the market. So it's like stall all of this and distract everybody. Stop paying attention to it. It's never going to work while I perfect my electric vehicle. Then, (laughs) And then we can do it. Cummins is working on an engine that doesn't use fuel. I don't think it's not Cummins. It's not the companies. And the truck manufacturers, they're all working on electric vehicles. But because they see that it's the way that it's the mm-hmm. way that it's going. But when you're in as an individual or as a company owner, when you're trying to figure out what to spend money on, what to invest in and what the costs are going to be, it just seems like overwhelming. Yeah. It, it's all this change. Why can't you just leave me alone for five minutes so that I can, you know. Well, that was one of the company. things that really struck me when I was doing scoring for the best fleets this year. And there was a number Mm-hmm. I think it was eight of the finalists that had electric trucks in inventory already. Not that they've ordered them and they're waiting on them. But they'd actually received them. Not tractor trailers. Tractors. Shunt trucks. Um, no, tractors. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, there was uh, shunt that trucks for sure. Um, a few. There were several of them that had it. I was really surprised by the number that are making not huge investments and they're not moving their entire fleet. But they're definitely but they're buying a couple. Their- and experimenting and seeing what happens and how to make it work. And it's like we've talked about before. They're the ones that are the innovators that are 
in, they're not really innovating in that they're coming up with a, a great solution, but they're kind of leading edge type where they're figuring out how to make that option work for them or what's going to be involved when that becomes the reality. They're going to be ready for it. And I think that was one of the things that I was talking to him about on the podcast that the best fleets are not, they don't, they're, they're not best fleets because there's an award, although I think they like the award, but the best fleets are there because they see it as a way to figure out what to do next and kind of do a self check. And they are able to branch out into experimental things and be at the forefront because they have figured out their business. They have figured out a stable workforce. They have figured out what they need to make everybody happy. And then they can go and poke around on these new things. They don't, they don't, they're not constantly just trying to hold things together. And that is, I think the biggest difference between the best fleets and everybody else in terms of innovation is that you can't innovate when everything is chaotic. Yeah. And if you haven't, if you haven't thought about what you're, so for example, it's chaos when people keep quitting. It's chaos when customers start asking you different things and you just jump at it. It's chaotic when people just kind of drop out of sight or people stop doing what they're supposed to be doing and they don't follow a process that you may not have documented. It's chaotic when you have constant claims and crashes. Exactly. Or it's chaotic when you're constantly changing technology. And yes. that... When you're moving from one vendor to another, we've seen that as well. That chaos is not going to help you be a better company. Yeah. And so calming the chaos is really the first step to being an innovator, being a great company to work for, being a great company in general. Like being a profitable company, you've got to calm the chaos because chaos t- costs money. We have a new episode title now, Calming the Chaos. Ca- calming the Chaos. That should be the what the uh, conference is called, Calming the Chaos. <laughs> calming the Chaos, But yes. it, it's true. You cannot have a profitable com- company when there's any element that's chaotic. Well, yeah, I would agree with you. Most of what we do in our day-to-day work now is finding ways to identify what's causing the chaos and finding ways to calm it. So and figure when, out a process, get it documented, make sure everybody understands it, make sure it's working, follow the process, and everybody is calmer when that happens. Yeah, when you have boundaries, like children, you know, children are better behaved when there are rules. Mm-hmm. They just are. And if you don't want to make rules for them, then you you best be getting used to like, following people around and yelling at them. (laughs) But if they know what their boundaries are and they know where, you know, what's going, and they know that the, um, what do you call it? The, the things that happen, the consequences, consequences are real and that you have created consequences and you, they know that it will happen. They stop running off and would they stop being chaotic? So you can see and and that's what you call well um, well brought up children tend to be not to be chaotic. <laughs> well brought up companies tend to be same not thing. Chaotic. Well brought up companies, well run companies are not chaotic, and when they are, and that is considered a you know a benefit, then it's not really chaos. It's like it looks like chaos, but it's not really. Hmm. It's engineered chaos. Ooh, well, engineered chaos. Well, creativity often looks chaotic. Okay, I see. Right? I see. So it's within specific bounds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everything that you do, if you have specific boundaries for it that are, and I'm not talking about boundaries that can't be changed, but you want to start with certain amounts of boundaries and then change them as the, as whatever you're doing changes. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the best way. And that's what I think has been successful for me is that, when we made a, when we make big changes, I don't want anybody to do anything outside the boundaries until we've figured out, is this the way to go? And then you kind of take another baby step and you see if that is still okay. And when the chaos starts creeping in, then you know that you have to go back and sort of reestablish mm-hmm. your boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Well, when you say, when you're saying engineered chaos, my first thought was, 
all of these funded companies that are scrambling for growth at all costs. And it is complete chaos internally because they're just trying to grow and grab every dollar that they can from everything. That's not engineered chaos. Like well, that's... it is by design, which is move fast and grab everything you can, but it's not sustainable or healthy. Well, it's also only, it only works under certain circumstances, which are not happening right now. So also using the analogy of the children, it's the, uh, the kid on a sugar rush. And if you have that kid on a sugar rush in a, you know, in a padded room, then you're fine. Right. If you have that kid with a sugar rush, you know, running around places with sharp points everywhere, then you're going to be going to have a little bit more damage. Yeah. And I think that all the funded companies had had some cushion. Mm. You know, they were they could run around. They had padded rooms. They could run with scissors and not worry too much about it because it cost of borrowing is low. You don't, you know, you can experiment and and you mm-hmm. can do all these things in in your the people giving you capital will be like, oh, that's cool. That could make us money in the future. They didn't have to be profitable. That's the padded room. Mm-hmm. But now that padded room has is you know got sharp points now, mm. and so people are not you know they have to be a lot more careful, mm. and that's where all of this uh, you know technology bust is happening. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we have digressed from the freight coach. So what else were you talking about on that podcast? We were talking about educating people about their pay and benefits, Uh, which I think is a really important thing to do. If you, you know, a lot of drivers have been trained to ignore pay packages uh, in favor of what they get at the end of their paycheck. So they don't know if they have a 401k or an RSP, a lot of times they opt out of it. They don't really know what their benefits do. So they don't know what their copay is or they don't know how much, you know, if they they have one of those, um, if they're younger and they have one of those plans where the they have to pay a lot, but they don't have to pay very much up front. Mm-hmm. So they're, what do you call it when you, with the stuff that you pay? Deductible. Deductible. No, not the deductible, the other one. The copay? No, when you pay, in, not installments, when you pay over time, like everything you pay, you get something deducted off your paycheck every month. The premiums? Yeah, premiums. Oh. Premiums are low. That's what everybody wants. But, right. But... If you want low premiums, then you're going to have to pay for it somewhere. So your deductible is probably going to be high. Mm -hmm. And as you age, you probably want to, you want to be able to think about what you want to do there. If you're young and you don't have any injuries or any illnesses or anything like that, that's one thing. But if you're older with lots of the things that happen when you're older, then you may not want another. So if you don't, if as a company, if you're not educating your staff about what the plan is or what they've got and what they are, you know, the other types of benefits that they have. So maybe you have an EAP. How do they use the EAP? Maybe they have some other wellness program. How do they use the wellness program? If you don't actually educate people on how to use the things that they've got, then you may as well not, you may as well not have them. Well, that also speaks to the importance of figuring out who it is that you're trying to hire that is an ideal match for those things. Because even if you educate everybody on those things, if you've hired a bunch of people who don't care about them, you've got a real mismatch in what you're offering versus what your employees value. So if you have a program where you really, let's say you don't have a great benefits package, but you have really good bonuses or something. You pay high, but you have really crappy benefits. Well, that's fine for single younger people who don't care about that stuff. They just want to make money quickly. So the benefits aren't so important. But if you've gone and hired a whole bunch of older people with families, well, you've got a real mismatch there. Those people are going to want benefits. They're going to want stability. They're going to want something that is a little bit more predictable for them. I think the issue is that trucking is going through a transition where they're going to have both. 
Yeah. And, and all kinds of people are fine and all kinds of programs are fine. It's more a matter of the fleet needing to understand what it is that they're offering and who it's ideal for and targeting their recruiting efforts towards those people. So maybe kind of like the dispatching ma- uh, matching. Mm-hmm. So you match with your dispatcher, but really what you should be doing is matching with your bonuses packages yeah. and all your different options and what would be right for you as a 32 year old uh, woman, single woman, mm-hmm. as opposed to a 48 year old married man. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be a, a big part of what I talk about at mid America when I'm talking about what makes a best fleet and what you should look for as a driver. The first thing I'm going to say is there's really no bad fleets. You, know, you all have some that you Perish hate. You all thought. have some that you've heard of the worst thing ever. But I'll tell you that all of those fleets have many drivers who love it there. So how can that be? It's all about matching. It's all about finding the right fit. So I'm going to, you're going to laugh at this. I'm going to go back to something that happened at our staff meeting today where we have an existential question um, supplied by Tommy. Mm. And um, so this week's existential question was, would you rather have five cents for every breath you take or 25 cents for every step you take? So the general consensus was that you breathe more than you walk. So therefore the breathing is going to be better. Yes. And I think that's kind of the way that drivers look at a job. Mm. We're going to go for the breathing. We're going to go for the five cents of breath. And my position is that it's better all around if you do the steps. Yeah. You know, it's going to be better for you if you if you take steps because your health is going to be better. You're going to have benefits outside of just the money. So mm. if you look at just the money, you don't have to walk around. You just have to breathe and isn't that easier. So therefore, that's the one that looks the best. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it in a more holistic fashion, walking is better for you. And you can do more. If you get do get 25 cents a step, you can make more money by walking. You don't have to be lazy and lie around and just get money while you sleep. That was the other thing. Everybody thought it was, you know, we can get make money while we sleep. So there was a, there was a very small proportion of the staff that actually wanted the walking one. Well, in our group, we break out into little groups to discuss this. In our group, the discussion was about what does it actually look like? How many breaths do you actually do in a day? And so we're trying to do some quick math because we only have like five minutes in these breakout rooms, trying to do some quick math to figure out how many breaths are you likely to do in a day and what does that translate to? And then, okay, how many steps are you going to do? And well, if you're doing steps and you're working out more, then you are going to be doing more breaths. So that's going to increase that. And so with that quick back of the napkin type math, we figured that the paper breath was actually better than the steps. Then we get back into the main room and there's super detail Anna who actually went and looked up to see how many breaths do people do uh, in a day on, uh, did a Google search to see what the average is and did the math and said, no, the uh, steps are better. Now this is Anna who is super fit and active saying, well, you're always going to do 10,000 steps in a day. So it's better for you. All of us lazy people are like, well, no, we're not. <laughs> we <laughs> do 400. <laughs> yeah. So, but you're right. Uh, a lot of times drivers will look for the quick and easy. It's, yeah, it's like water. We'll always find the easiest path through something. They'll always find a way out. They'll always find the quickest answer to something. And what is going to be the best path in the long run? You have to look at it more holistically. And that's the same way we talk about Everything in the best fleets program, that's the same way we talk about safety programs and we tell people to do that with their training. Look at it holistically. Don't look for the quick answer. And that is one of the things that we always see people doing that is never a sign of strength, is never really a sign of maturity of the business or strength of their safety program is that they're looking for the quick answer. I want uh, I want a million driver training videos that I can throw at my drivers every month and check a box that it's been done. Okay. 
boom, that's good enough. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to do anything with that data that I collect. I just want to check the box that I did that. And on the surface, yeah, it looks like they've done something. Yeah, they're getting paid for breathing, but they're not actually better off. I would agree. <laughs> I went in a whole bunch of different subjects. Yeah, areas there. but it was a good it was a good existential question. It was good. And look, we turned it into an analogy and uh Well that's what I was thinking is that the whole idea is an analogy is are you gonna try and do the least amount of work for the money that you get or are you gonna try and maximize it? Mm-hmm. And I think Yeah. The least amount of work or maximize your money. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, so there are all of you people who thought that the five cents of breath was better. I was one of those people. I know you I were. It, oh, I was doing quick math and it seemed to be better. I was, I at first thought, eh, and then I was like, well, why wouldn't I want to get 25 cents per step? Because it'll make me want to walk. I'll live longer. Well, here's the angle that struck me is, okay, this is fine in this hypothetical world where you're getting this, but... What I started thinking is, okay, who's paying you that and why are they paying for it? (laughs) What is it that they want that justifies them paying you to do this? How are they taking that data and monetizing it by selling your data to some advertiser? Yeah. What ads am I going to see based on paper step or paper breath? And then, well, the thing that I came up with was, hey, wait a minute. Oh, no, it wasn't me. Someone in my group said, well, what if you can't walk? Yeah. Or is, or if you have a car accident and you yeah. can't walk, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, this isn't very yeah. accessible. And Tommy dismissed that very quickly. Yeah, paper push, that's fine. <laughs> if you're in a wheelchair, every push is good. Yeah. Yes, but he didn't he didn't explain that. Hmm. Yeah. So there we are. So what else has been happening? Well, we got something else to uh, discuss that has come up for us that is rarely spoken of in the trucking education world, and this is a veering off quite a bit from breathing versus walking. Although you actually do kind of allude to it with the whole wheelchair thing. We just had a long discussion about accessibility Mm because we've had some uh, questions come in about accessibility and uh, e-learning and whether we support current standards on accessibility. And uh, I think it actually will make for a very interesting article maybe a webinar down the road, but we're definitely going to be writing up an article because there are guidelines uh, for web content accessibility that people are supposed to follow. Their best practice is to follow them. And we have most of them baked into our content and very few things we don't have. And it was always very purposeful in not supporting those because they were things that really didn't apply to an audience of truck drivers. For instance, designing content in such a way that screen readers can navigate it and um, describe it to people who are blind. So screen readers will take web content, will sift through that content in a particular order and read it out loud to the, um, to the viewer. Well, not the viewer, I guess, to the, to the audience. Yeah. So if you're blind, blind you can still use a computer. Yeah. So in order to do that and to have that content make sense, it needs to be laid out in a particular way on the page and needs to be labeled in certain ways and you have to use particular types of um, objects on your on your page and things like that. And we have never done much with that in the trucking space for the simple fact that anybody who needs a screen reader also is not operating a commercial vehicle. You know, there's there's not a lot of overlap between people using screen readers and people who have a commercial yeah, driver's license. Yeah, the Venn license. diagram is more yeah. like two balloons. Yeah. So we've never really done much with that. And similarly, there are some things uh, for physical accessibility for people who can't use a mouse and you know, that kind of thing. We've never done much with that because, again, to have a commercial driver's license, you pretty much have to have the level, the level of physical dexterity that is going to allow you to operate a mouse, use a mouse. So it hasn't really been an issue for us. But as we start building courses for audiences outside of drivers, so the office staff, uh, the management, things like that, there is the possibility that there would be some people who do need some of these things. So we are working on adding that in. It's not really that difficult for us to add those into the runtime because when I first designed it, I kind of had the idea that at some point we might need to 
and we really just have to supplement a few things there. So it shouldn't be that difficult for us to add that in, but it is something that we're going to be adding in there to make sure that we do uh, follow all of those guidelines and make sure that we are as accessible as possible. Well, we do have some accessibility features that... Yeah, we have a lot, just not those two particular Yeah, things. those are the kind of the, the two that people think of. But what we do, that's one of the reasons that we have all the text on the page. Um, so and that, the audio, text and audio together. Yeah, text and audio is always the same. There's no, there's no difference. Um, we also are, design our images so that they're clear, they can be seen without, like they're not... Things are not, well, red, green, color blindness. We we generally try to make sure that we're not using the red color to, you know, to confuse things. Like if you use red and green, like red text on a green background, you can, some people can't see that at all because they don't see red or green. They kind of see mixture of gray, gray basically. Um, so things like that, we are also putting in, and I'm quite happy about this, we're putting in a an audio controller so that you can speed up the audio and you can slow it down, which I know a lot of people want to speed it up. And we're going to go a little way like we're not going to you're not going to be able to speed it up so much. that it sounds like, you know, the chipmunks or anything like that. But what I was really more interested in is the ability to slow it down for people with some some learning disabilities involve processing issues where they can't take in information that fast and slowing the audio down is going to allow people to to do that and i think that's going to be a kind of cool feature that's going to come out very quickly actually i think the beginning of march it's not in today's release it's in the march no release. it's in the march yeah so that'll be nice mm-hmm. along with some of those other enhancements on the accessibility side like keyboard control and keyboard navigation are things. they all scheduled for merch um i don't think they all are but those things will be coming soon and they're not that difficult to add in so uh, it will be a nice enhancement yes and a nice enhancement to the uh to the runtime which doesn't get enhanced all that often yeah it's very simple and in general, it should sort of stay out of the way. It should give you the tools that you need and then stay out of the way. But this, uh, adding in the ability to change the speed of the playback, adding in some extra keyboard controls, uh, changing a few things in order to support screen readers uh, a little bit, that's uh, that's going to make things much better. So, And I'm happy about that because of the few other people that do educational content online for the trucking industry, I don't think anybody is doing this at all. I don't think anybody's paid any attention to this really. So, well, unless, I mean, unless they're using some already built in. Yeah. You know, stuff that's already built into the browser or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's possible. There is some of that that is uh, possible, but I think a lot See, this is one of those areas where trucking is very different. Like the accessibility stuff, we were doing that in the early 2000s before we even came into trucking because in the corporate world, they were really embracing sort of diversity and accessibility and trying to make a web world that worked for everybody on the corporate side of things. But trucking really wasn't there because of the limits of the uh, the CDL. It really wasn't an issue. You didn't have to think about it. But now more of these larger companies are having to do it anyway. So public companies uh, like FedEx and like these larger public organizations start getting heat uh, from shareholders about this kind of thing. So they have to make sure that they are covered. And as a result, um, if they've got their own fleet, that fleet needs to have accessibility covered. But more and more, it's trickling down into suppliers. So it isn't just what the yep. public company is doing on their own. It's what their suppliers are doing that they have to answer for. So all of those trucking companies that uh, supply them need to have a good answer on all of these things as well. And so we see that. We see it on cybersecurity. We see it uh, on language issues. We see it on like diversity type uh, initiatives, all kinds of different things where people have to have fairly small companies have to have a pretty robust, pretty mature answer to these questions because their customer, the giant public company, is required to look into what all of the uh, suppliers are doing as well. 
So it's been, uh, it's always interesting to see, you know, when stuff comes back, stuff that we dealt with outside of trekking, when sort of trekking gets involved into it and uh, we see that happening in the industry, it's always interesting to see how it all comes around. Yep. So something else uh, that I have been uh, doing a couple of interviews with that I think is interesting uh, is some stories on some new entrant programs. So there was one that I did an uh, interview uh, with for Transport Topics that came up on the weekend, this week's edition of their uh, of their magazine, and it was very long, sort of deep dive into new entrant programs and new entrant training, and we talked about the things that drivers need to learn beyond just how to uh, you know shift gears and uh, turn the wheel and that sort of stuff. And I've got another one tomorrow, uh, an interview with a fleet owner for a story about how companies can take non-CDL drivers and turn them into CDL, so upgrade them, and the differences in the training programs for those different paths, and uh, also the differences that come from heavy duty versus medium duty and local versus regional versus over the road and things like that. And so this is one that I actually had to think about for a little bit, think about the uh, the differences there and there's obvious stuff, of course, the equipment uh, may be different if it's a medium duty truck versus heavy duty. And you know, there are going to be specifics around that and specifics on the requirements, depending on the type of licensing you're getting. But even outside of that, there are a lot of things that people need to know that are going to be very different for the different types of uh, of job. And I think people don't think about that very much. The, um, like if you are Doing a local job, it's very different from being an over-the-road person. It's a very different lifestyle. You know, one is more customer-facing, and the other one is staying away from customers and staying on the road. One is more local traffic, and one is highways. You know, very different types of approach. And so one of them, you're home a lot. Another one, you're almost never home. And people don't really think about that in terms of training the driver. They think a lot about the equipment. They don't spend as much time thinking about the lifestyle things, which is why we see people struggling with new entrant programs or when they hire new entrants, they have such high turnover with those people who realize that they're not really interested in that particular life cycle or lifestyle of being on the road. So the more successful fleets do spend more time thinking about that and and talking about how uh, drivers need to need to be prepped for things that are happening on the road and what the lifestyle is going to be. So That should be an interesting conversation. Well, it's interesting because over the years, what I've found is that the local and the regional routes tend to be the ones that are more desirable. And those go to the older, more tenured drivers at the company because they want to have the more stable, more stable income. And there tends to be more stability. It tends to be a a higher echelon of, of, of job. You know, those are those are the better jobs rather than the irregular route, you know, whenever, whatever, I don't know what I'm hauling day to day. If it's more regular and more predictable, it tends to be more valuable. But it seems like those routes should actually be for the beginners Mm -hmm. instead of going on the irregular route and not knowing what you're hauling day to day, where it's very confusing and very haphazard, you'd think that the opposite would be better for a new younger driver is to, you know, do maybe not an in, inner, like not inner city, but maybe not a city route, but something where they're doing the same thing every day for a little while and then move into something that's a bit more challenging. I don't know if that's actually coming up. I don't know if that's how carriers have arranged it, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're still giving the more stable routes to more tenured drivers, whereas it would be more beneficial for the newer drivers. To yeah, have them. you're right. Well, also those kind of local things where you're doing a lot more stops in a day, you get a lot more practice getting in and out of yards and backing in and things. That's the stuff that the younger drivers need. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not totally sure how these new entrant programs tend to move people into positions, like what kind of positions they actually do. I know for the under 21s, they're very careful about what jobs mm-hmm. they do, but I don't think they're as careful with just a new, a new driver. Yeah. 
Yeah, it should be an interesting conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. I've also lined up uh, Halver Lines for them to talk to as well because oh, they have nice. a very successful new entrant program. And uh, I know Halver teaches people on different types of equipment. So they've got van and flatbed and things like that. So that's part of it as well. Like how does the training change when you've got different types of freight that you're going to be hauling? Well, if I was running a a new entrant program, then I would have all three. Like I would have, not all three, you you mentioned three, that's why I said three, but I would have as many different types of vehicle as I could so that people could, or maybe as many different types of trailer as I could Mm -hmm. so that people could see what it's like. Because I think a lot of people end up just driving dry van because they think it's the easiest one. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that reefer is any more difficult than dry van. I don't. There's I mean, a little bit more. You have to pay attention to the to the reefer, but like, really, is there much difference that you're still operating it? Like, it's the the vehicle is the same. Yeah. There might be a little bit more weight at the front, but I mean that that's going to be a few more things to check. Yeah, and that's just a list. Mm-hmm. And uh, like. But if you don't ever get introduced to flatbed or tanker until, mm-hmm. you know, well, I don't know how you would get introduced to them if you are included. Well, that's if it an interesting included. point. We certainly talked to a bunch of fleets that are flatbed people that have what they call a new entrant program, mm-hmm. but it's for people with CDL that haven't done flatbed before. Yep. And I have to believe that it's the same thing for tanker. If you've done van and haven't done tanker, it's different world you almost need a different you do need a new entrant program for that kind of same thing for car haulers right or livestock there's a lot of specialties there i remember when uh, we were talking to central oregon who's a hall of famer now in the best lease program but having this conversation with the um the ceo who's now retired rick williams always talking about how well we can't do that because we're a flatbed company and we can't do that. We can't do that. And then, you know, the next year coming in with what they are doing. Yeah. And then doing it. And then doing it anyway. But you're protesting loudly. And then, you know, every time Rick Williams protested loudly about something, he would solve it in the next couple of years. See, it's the same as the people with electric vehicles. It's like, oh, I can't do it. I can't, I can't possibly do it. T- and then they're off doing it. Yeah. Yeah. They just I don't know. want you to look. Yeah. Just don't <laughs> they don't want to look while, while I go do it. They're failing. Yeah. It's it's weird. It's like they don't really want to do it, but in their heads they're thinking, "Yeah, I should do it." And you know, and then a couple of years after, it's like they were always doing it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that happens a lot. That's human nature. Yeah. That's just something that happens. Not very many people are really, you know, dying to go into leap into the unknown. It you know, people want it, want things to stay the same because it feels safer, more secure. Yeah. But, you know, California has to happen. <laughs> you know, if it wasn't California, it'd be something else. You know, some somebody else would draw the line in the sand. Yeah. And it would be Oregon or Washington. Or Rhode Island. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's going crazy. <laughs> no, they just don't have good bridges so that they have nasty bridge laws. Yeah. Well, I think that is a good place for us to wrap up. Mm-hmm. We can calm the chaos here. Let's calm the chaos. And end this. So thanks everyone for listening. Have a good day. Bye.